It's one of those things I get so focused on preparing for the sermon that whenever anything else has to come up, I get all flustered and I get out of whack. So like Mother's Day stuff, as much as I probably should have said a bunch of other things, uh, those bags are good shopping bags. Uh, Some people really like them. So if you want one of those, take them on the way out. They're free. Take as many as you want. Um, But let us come today. Let's come under his word. Let's hear what God has to say for us today. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the blessings that you have given us, Lord. For all the great examples of women who obey you and follow you that we look to. Lord, I just uh, pray that you be with us today as we delve into your word, as we look at the, the way that the enemy attacks and, and the strength that you give us, Lord, as the song we just sang to you will just flesh out in the scriptures today, Lord. I pray that our minds are opened and our hearts are convicted and that we will see where we need to change, where we need to grow, and that we will continue to submit ourselves to you, submit ourselves to your word, and that you may grow us and edify us into your body. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we've been going through Ephesians, we're, we're towards the end of Ephesians, And if you look back at Paul's letter as a whole, it's kind of broken up into two sections. The first section um, is loaded, actually the whole book's loaded with wisdom and theology. But the first section in chapters 1 through 3, he really goes through a discussion on defining the theology of, of proper, of the purpose of the church and who the focus of the church is and who is at work. And if you go back, I did this actually this week, I went back and I read through Ephesians and I highlighted every time it said, by God, in Christ, through Christ, with Christ. And you will find that one of the main things Paul is trying to demonstrate in Ephesians is that it is about Christ. And everything we have comes from him and through him. And as we've been going through the second half, it becomes much more practical on how to live out this life that Paul is discussing. And he's been discussing this balance between living in the darkness that we were before we were saved and then living in the light and what Christians should look like as they do that. And as we got to chapter 5, we looked the last couple weeks, over a month, on the Christian household as an example of what it looked like to live filled by the Holy Spirit of God to have the Holy Spirit of God at work in our lives. And one of the ways that Paul brought that to life was through the Christian household, through marriages and through parenting, through children. And today we'll transition into what looks like almost a new section of Scripture. And it's what most title as the armor of God. Um, I would expect that everyone in here, most everyone in, in here, has heard a sermon on the armor of God. I would also expect that most people have heard many sermons on the armor of God. It is something that we come back to many times. Some great preachers have been known to to go back to this over and over throughout the years because there's so much in it and so much of how it plays out. I think another reason we hear a lot about it is when you look at it, it's one of those ones that actually makes us feel kind of good. It's one where God is giving to us right? We want what it presents. And I think sometimes we might take the good news of what he's giving us and forget or really not grasp the practicality of what's going on and that what he is actually saying here. And as we look at this, what we're going to see is that it is possible to miss some meaning here if we go too quick. And so what I really want us to do as we come to the the armor of God on the next couple of weeks is that we kind of of flush our minds and just, once again, see what the Word of God says. Now, it's going to affirm much that you've been taught, but I think these are some verses that we can read into very easily. And as I've been watching sermons out there, there's a lot of of Christianity speak that speaks of these as, as tools that we get to you know, wield in our greatness and our goodness, and that's really not what he's talking about here. You know, we're going to dive into the spiritual realm. Well, God doesn't define everything there is in the spiritual realm. He tells us parts of us. He tells us how to interact with it, and it's something that we've heard about, 
Uh, there's kind of two sides of the spiritual realm. There's the side that we ignore that exists altogether, that there is no such thing as, as Satan, there is no such thing as demons, there is no such thing as any type of spiritual battle. And then on the other side of it, you have this look at uh, Satan and demons as these like all-powerful beings, like almost equal to God. And, how, and there's just a whole bunch of misunderstanding in the middle. False teaching, lack of teaching. And so as we go through this, I hope one of my goals is that we will come to have a better understanding of the actual battle that's going on in our lives today and in our churches and in our homes. So as we dive into Ephesians, we're going to be in verse, or chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 today. And so as we read that, it says, finally. So Paul is going to take everything he's written from chapter 1, going through what the church is in Christ, through the practicality, through the home, and then he's going to kind of wrap it up in this very impactful final section that relates back to all of the different parts. Unfortunately, because this is trans translated from Greek to English, we lose his teaching technique. There's a lot of things that he is doing here to, to build on this and to build a, cli a climatic end to this letter. And we will lose that because we just don't have the same syllables in the same way he does it. But he says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything, to take your stand. So, as Paul has spoken on what it means to be a spirit-filled believer, to walk in the light, he comes to the point of what is the opposition to that? See, I think if we go back and look at the scriptures on husbands and wives and parents and children, most of us would acknowledge that those are good things, right? That if we have um, a marriage that is in this way, or we parent or our children act in this way, that this is a good thing. However, we see the good of it, and then the reality is we don't necessarily see it play out in our homes, right? It's like we're told that this is what's going to happen, but then when we go home, something else exists. Something else is there. Something else is at work. And so Paul is going to go into, and he's talking about what is hindering, what is we're fighting against, and what is the opposition against the Spirit alive in our lives. What keeps us from living out the promises and the life the way that God is telling us? And before he gets in there, he goes back to, and he starts with, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. See, as he comes to the closing remarks of this very descriptive and practical book, he tells the church, he tells Ephesians, and then through them, us, that we are to be empowered, that we're to be strengthened. Strengthened means to be enabled to become capable of doing something, to perform a task. So when he says, be strengthened, he says, come to the point where you can do what I'm going to tell you next. He, to be capable of fighting the battle. And he says we're to be strengthened. So typically when we think about getting strengthened, what do we think of? We think about working out, right? If we want to be physically more powerful, what do we do? We go to the gym. We, we work, we run. If we want better endurance, we, we push ourselves, you know. If we want, if we want to, to gain more finances, if we want to get a better job, what do we do? We go train for different things. If we, if we want to know something, we study, we listen, we ask questions. See, as we grow in this world, we exert effort that breaks us down and then builds us back up, Right? That's how we, that's how human beings grow in this world. But that's not what Paul says here, is it? He says, a believer is to be strengthened. And we are to be strengthened by who? By the Lord. And by whose vast strength? 
his. See, what Paul is saying is that we have to rely on something that's outside of us. We cannot will ourselves. We cannot work ourselves. We cannot be good enough Christians living out the best life now to gain what he is talking about here. See, this vast strength comes from the Lord. It comes from being filled with the Spirit of God. It doesn't come from any of man's work. See, it's by God's power given through the Holy Spirit that we actually have any strength at all. Now, we think we do. We think we're powerful. But if we're really honest with ourselves, how much control do we really have in life? We've seen many instances this year of how out of control things are. From health and from different things going on, from jobs, you know, we realize that sometimes we are not in control as much as we think we are. If you go back to Ephesians 3, it says in, in verse 16 through 21, Paul says, I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width, height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness, all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. See, Paul is, is speaking to them that says to be filled with the Spirit, to be strengthened with the power in your inner being, to be rooted in that. See, he prays that God grants the believer to be strengthened inside them and that their hearts would be full of faith and through faith. See, we need to be strengthened. The only reason Paul says we need to be strengthened is because what? We're weak. Do we agree with that? We don't act that way, but the reality is, is we're weak. There is an immaturity that must be addressed in every human being. We must work through the weakness and accept his strength in lieu of it. In chapter 4, he goes on to say, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ, until we all reach unity in faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by proper working of each individual part. See, every individual part of the church needs to grow. It needs to be strengthened. Every single one of us. It talks about being tossed around by the different teachings that are out in our world today. Do we find that? Do you look out and go, how in the world do you believe what you believe? They look at us and go, how in the world do you believe what you believe? You guys are all crazy. But Paul says, for us to be strengthened, for us to not be blown around by the different teachings of the world, that we must be rooted and filled with God's strength. But the question must be asked is, do we believe that God is mighty? Do we actually believe that? Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and all-inspiring God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. 
Do we look at God in that way? Is God all powerful? Or is he a fairy tale that sits on our shelf? Do we believe that in his word and the power of his word? Colossians 1, 10 through 13 says, So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. To be strengthened with all power so we may have endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. We're in a time period that we're going to have to endure. We're going to have to be patient. Ephesians 1, 19 through 21. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the mighty works of his strength? He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. The cross. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is one of the mightiest works if not the mightiest work that God has done. A work that only God can do, a work that demonstrates His power over everything. And it says that in here, He gives those who are filled with the Holy Spirit a measure of that strength. Not all of it. We're not many gods. We don't have all the powers that God has. But He gives us the strength for certain things. See, and the thing is, we cannot work hard enough to gain this strength. You can read your Bible every day, every minute for the rest of your life and not a, get the strength that God's talking about here. You can go to every church service. You can give 90% of your income to the church and it will not give what the Bible is teaching here. This is submission to God the Father through Christ the Son, for the forgiveness of our sins, being obedient to Him, living, reading His Word, applying it to our lives. So the question is, why don't we look for this strength? Mostly because, once again, we believe we've got it all taken care of on our own, don't we? How many of you wish your kids would just stop trying to do it all on their own? Right? Right? that you just wish they would just listen. Take some guidance. Don't have to go through the same punishment, the same trials and error, and end up with the same wounds that you know are coming. In your heart, you want them. You want them with all your might just to listen so that they will step forward. And I think in the same way, we do much with God as well. He teaches a lot and we ignore most of it. See, Paul, after it says being strengthened, he says we're to put on, in verse six, or chapter 6, verse 11, we're to put on the full armor of God so you can stand against the schemes of the devil. So Paul's going to introduce the armor of God here. And we're going to talk about it over the next couple weeks. So we're just going to introduce that here. But see, we're to put on the armor. The word put on means to clothe yourself. And the tense of this Greek word, there's no, there's no indication that you ever take it off. So you put on the armor of God and you live in it. You never take it off. It means to be clothed. We're to don ourselves with not part of the armor, but what, how much of it? The full armor of God, right? How many of you ever see someone run out to battle and they just have a helmet on, right? Like, it's not very effective if you're just wearing part of the armor, right? Like, there's a reason and a purpose for all of the different pieces, and we'll go through that later on. But the purpose of being strengthened, the purpose of this, at putting on the armor, is for the reason so that we may stand. 
That we may stand against what? Against the schemes of the devil. That's pretty clear, right? It says, put on the armor of God, the full armor of God, so you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. See, before Christ, before salvation, all people have is living out their fleshly desires. Under the authority of the ruler of the air, which is a reference to the devil. See, without Christ, there is no other option other than living for yourself. That's all there is. Now you may do, or a lost person may do many wonderful things in the world, but they do those wonderful things for their own personal gain, their own personal satisfaction. Paul has constantly been talking about this idea of walking in the light, being taken out of the darkness, putting on the new self, putting off the old self, what we were before and what we are after. See, it says the ways of the world is the evil age. That's this time. There's only one time period left between now and the return. So when it talks about the evil age, the evil day, he's talking about this time. And we're in an evil age and an evil time, as the Bible says. We are in a time that is rejecting morals of God or morals that align with God. Is that, is that a true statement? Is morality changing drastically? What the definition of moral is and isn't in the world's eyes? It's because we live in a time where people get to make up their own truth. If my shirt is pink, you can't tell me no. It's, my shirt is pink. And you're going to say it's blue. I'm like, no, it's not. It's pink. You have to agree with me that it's pink. Why? Because we live in a time that facts are not necessarily important. We, so we're in this time period, this evil day, where we reject, the, the world rejects the morals of God. Because the ruler of this day is who? Of the world. It's Satan. See, in contrast to walking in the light, the lost carry out the inclinations of the flesh. This is their nature. This is all they have. This is who they are. 1 John 4, 1-6, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is, is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming. Even now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who does not who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. Does that ring true today? You go out and you share your moral, your Christian beliefs. Does the world listen to you? No. When you go out and talk about things that, you know, that, we sh that shouldn't be happening, do they listen to us? No. Because there are spirits and there's a spiritual battle and there's things going on that are false. Are there many false prophets in today's world? There's always been many false prophets. Go through most of the New Testament. A lot of it is talking about fighting against false doctrines and false teachers. And so as we look at this and we must acknowledge that there's these two powers there. 
1 John 2, 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. As you look at this, you see the ESV simplifies uh, verse 16 or actually translates verse 16 as the methods of the enemy are summed up in the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. As we look at that and we look at the schemes of the enemy, we may question what is a scheme? Well, a scheme, it comes from the Greek word Methodia, sound familiar? Methods. A scheme is a method. It is an organized way of doing something. It's a systematic plan. So when the Bible says that we are to stand against the schemes of the devil, we are to stand against the systematic methods that are here. And the Bible says that those methods are defined as the world. The authority of Satan that God has given him, the rule that he has, if you want to say that, is that he, the enemy, sets up systems in our world that go against God. And we see that today, do we not? There is a lot of things out there that are ungodly. Where do they come from? They come from the ruler of this age. And they're summed up in the desires of the flesh, the lusts of the eye, and the pride of life, or the pride of possessions. If you think about the things that we struggle with as Christians, what do we struggle with? The desires of our flesh. What do we want? We want all the pleasure under the sun with no consequences. Lust of the eyes. If we see it, we want it. So I don't get to go to Costco with my wife. I am banned from the Costco trips. The checkbook comes out differently at the end if I'm there. So if I get to go, which is like once a year, maybe once every five years, I push the cart. Hands on the cart at all times. Lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. The pride of possessions. All of those things are at work in the world. All of those things break down into one one statement. I want. When we sit in the world and we look around, we have wants, do we not? Do we all have wants? We all want more. We all want different. The grass is always greener and then it's not. We have wants. We have desires. Galatians says we have desires that come from two places. Desires that come from the Holy Spirit at work in our lives and desires from the flesh. See, the lost only have the desires of the flesh. The saved, the redeemed, are saved, free from the consequences of sin in the end. However, those desires are still there. And Satan's work in this world still produces things that are tempting to us. What is a temptation? It's putting something in front of you that you want and that you desire. We're all tempted by different things. There's some of you, a new video game would not tempt you at all. Others, a new car would not tempt you at all. Others, a new blouse would not tempt you at all. I don't know what it is, but there are different things that tempt us in different ways. And it's when we chase those things. And those temptations do not come from God. James 1, 13 through 15 says, No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. See, as believers, there's still two sides of us. 
We still have this fleshly leftover want that will be there until we're glorified with Christ when we pass away from this world and are taken into his. And we have the Holy Spirit, which is Paul's main focus here, living in the Holy Spirit. See, the flesh wants the things of this world. These methods, these schemes of the enemy are the world's methods to give us what we want, naturally. Listen to commercials sometime. I kind of did that this week. Commercials always go back to, what do you want? Like, what do you want? What do you need? What do you want? What do you need? And they tell you that you really need it and you really want it. And they tell you that other people are really good people if they have what you want and what you need. See, the enemy puts these temptations, these systems in that are in front of us all the time. And see, the temptation itself is not necessarily wrong. It's the giving in to temptation, following it and acting on that temptation. Now, that temptation could be mental. That, could, that temptation could be physical. But there comes a point in time, just because something crosses our path and we want it isn't bad. It's once we want it and desire it and we choose to go after it that it births, as James says, it's conceived into sin. And one of the schemes that the devil uses is the scheme to make people believe that he doesn't exist, that there is no spiritual battle, that there is no enemy. And the other one, like I said, is the one where we give the enemy so much power that he has control over a believer. Have you ever heard Satan made me do it? Have you ever heard that? Or demon made me do it? We've, we've heard that. Here's a, a quote from, from John MacArthur on the subject. It says, there is no clear example in the Bible where a demon ever inhabited or invaded a true believer. Never in the New Testament epistles are believers warned about the possibility of being inhabited by demons. Neither do we see anyone rebuking, binding, or casting out demons out of a true believer. The epistles never instruct believers to cast out demons, whether from a believer or an unbeliever. Christ and the apostles were the only ones who cast out demons, and in every instance, the demon-possessed people were unbelievers. So as you look at spiritual warfare and stuff like that, to say that a demon or Satan could go in and control a believer who is empowered by and who is indwelt by who? The Holy Spirit, by God. That means that the evil spirits would have enough power to push the Holy Spirit out. And that's not how it works. So when we look at it, the devil's schemes are in the world. They're around us. True believers do not have to worry about the devil overpowering them or the devil taking control of them. But they do have to deal with the schemes of the world. And this is the battle that we fight. We're to put on this armor so we can stand against these schemes. Because the devil is not alone. Ephesians 6.12 For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. There is a struggle, and it's a spiritual struggle. This word struggle means it means it's translated to wrestle. And you're like, well, that's kind of weird, wrestle. Well, if you think back to their time period, many times battles... They would start out with one side over here and one side over there. But as soon as everyone went like this, right, what happened? It turned into absolute chaos. And many times the battle would devolve into physical hand-to-hand wrestling combat, life or death, survival or die. Close quarters, wrestling. That's the image that he's trying to portray here, that this is a close. This isn't staying 200 yards away. This isn't staying a mile away and shooting a mortar. This is hand-to-hand, in our face, right there. It's, in, it's intimate, it's close, and it's deadly. See, the word, as we go into this, we are fighting this battle, and the true adversary is the spiritual one. 
He says, our struggle is not against the flesh and blood. And then he goes into this list that is basically, if you were to go through it, it is a hierarchy of what the demons, fallen angels are. If you look at the angels, you have a hierarchy of archangels, and you have different ones that do different things at different levels. What Paul is addressing here is that those hierarchies still exist, and Satan controls them to do things in the world. Now, has he gone into immense depth and immense uh, clarity on what this looks like? No. Why? Because he's like, you don't need to worry about the enemy if you're standing in me. If you are with me, in me, that's the important part. If you are strengthened by me, then guess what? You don't have to worry about that. The focus of the scripture is not for us to figure out how to go and fight demons. The focus of the scripture is how we can fall in love and be strengthened by the Lord. To focus on that. And as we look at this, and we see that we continue to work on, as we talk about these different things and these different methods, one of the biggest methods out there is to separate the church, to break us into divisions, right? To get people fighting. That's why the New Testament talks so much about being in unity. I found a story this week. A teacher uh, was teaching on the Salem witch trials in school. And so she told her kids, she said, we're going to do a, a project here. I'm going to go around and whisper in everyone's ear, and I'm going to tell you that some of you are witches and some of you are not. Your goal is to take an hour and you need to find groups and figure out who the witches are. Find your groups, and anyone found with a witch in their group fails the project. And so they dive right into it. They're interrogating people. They're asking questions. They start looking for nuances and facial expressions, and people feel guilty and stuff like that. And after the hour, they're broken up into these different groups. They've all been separated. They've all looking. They're all worried at the other one. They're all looking at each other. They have no trust with the people other than the ones they have around them. And then the teacher asks, raise your hand if you're a witch. And no one's hand went up. It was the idea that there was something different that caused the division, caused the separation. See, one of the schemes of the enemy is to cause us to find issues that are not important and cause us to separate based on either non-important issues or non-existent issues. See, we've looked at a lot of the schemes already. We looked at the family. You know, we have this huge attack on the family in this country, right? Everything that's going on is attacking the family. We looked at statistics on the fatherless. We looked at things on marriage. We looked at the schemes of the devil on gender. We looked at, um, we've talked about some of the things going on in our schools, in politics, in finances, in the media, in digital adultery, in digital idolatry, and many other areas. See, we can go out there and acknowledge that this world is going in, a di- in the wrong direction, right? But we're supposed to focus on, and because of that, because of all of those schemes, because of what the devil is doing, he then says in verse 13, for this reason, for this reason, Take up the full armor of God so you may be able to resist in the evil day, having prepared everything to take your stand. Based on everything that he was just talking about, for this reason, so we can resist to oppose the schemes and to hold our ground. He also says, having prepared everything, See, if there's any hope for us to stand in a battle, you have to prepare for the battle, right? How many of you were in the military? Did you train before you left? What would the scenario be where you signed up, you signed on the bottom line, and they said, here's your backpack, here's your gun, here's your plane? 
How would that work out? You, are you ready to stand? To go into mortal combat? No. We wouldn't do that in our real life. However, we'll do it in this world today. See, the world is systematically going in the wrong direction. That's what Paul's saying. And it will continue to do so. Do you feel like it's going in the wrong direction? Do you acknowledge that? To us it is, but to the lost it is not. It makes sense to the lost. And you're like, how can that be? But it does, through deception, through the father of lies. See, Satan will continue to try and keep people away from God, to turn them from who? From him. Whether they're saved or not, he will continue to tempt and tempt and tempt and tempt to get people to follow themselves. And if you think it's interesting, there should be a slide in there, Simon. There's a picture. This is not false. This is in Virginia. Hey, kids, let's have fun at After School Satan Club. Science and community service projects, puzzles and games, nature activities, arts, crafts, snacks, and tons of fun. Parents, your child will learn benevolence and empathy at Satan Club, critical thinking, problem solving, creative expression, personal sovereignty, compassion. This satanic temple is a non-theist religion that views Satan as a literary figure who represents a metaphorical construct of rejecting tyranny and champion the human mind and spirit. After School Satan Club does not attempt to con convert children to any religious ideology. Instead, the satanic temple supports children to think for themselves. All after-school Satan clubs are based on activities centered around the seven fundamental tenets and the emphasis on and emphasize a scientific, rationalist, non-superstitious worldview. This is the new Satan club in Virginia. I cut off the school at the bottom. He's not the only one. And I had to look it up a couple times to make sure that this wasn't something that someone had gone out there. Um, the first, uh, I believe it was the first, what was it called, Satan, Satanic Temple, the first conference of Satanists, country, or United States happened in the last couple weeks or last couple months. And the first thing they did is, whip, was stand up there and rip a Bible in half as they talked about the false ideologies of the world, they stood up there with God's word and ripped page after page after page and put it on the ground. The world will continue to follow these schemes of the enemy. And so the question that Paul is raising here is are we prepared to stand? Because eventually that stuff is going to hit us more at home than it is right now. I think we're getting a feel for it. But I look back in the Old Testament where a prophet stood, where no one stood in the gap, where if there was just one, God wouldn't have destroyed, right? It's not the first time that it's been here. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my brothers, dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor is the Lord. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Be steadfast, be strengthened. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11 says, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers through the world. The God of grace, of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be the dominion forever. Amen. It's just getting there for us. And the thing is, is it's interesting because he doesn't say, go attack. Right? Put on the armor of God to resist, to stand firm. See, in the end, the battle is already won. 
We're not trying to win the battle. We're to stand until the completion of God's work on this world is done and that we are glorified with him in heaven. Colossians 2, 14 through 15, he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and is taken away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed, disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. See, we will stand in the fact not only that there's a victory, but that when we stand, we stand to the end. Right? That in the Holy Spirit, we make it to the last battle. We make it through the battle because it's already been won. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present or things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? See, as we look at this, we have to be careful that we don't try to dive into something that we're not supposed to. But we also can't ignore what's going on around us. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Be aware. God's Word gives us the sufficiency. It's sufficient to give us everything we need to deal with to stand firm in this world. So the question is, how does this apply to us today? Maybe, maybe there's someone in here who just doesn't know Jesus, doesn't have the saving grace. They find themselves starting to see that that their actions or your actions are, are not godly and you want to deal with that. And I would like to continue to answer those questions if you have a desire to get to know him, to figure out who Jesus is and that he died for you. Maybe we're believers, but we find ourselves fighting the same battles over and over and over again and falling into the same temptations over and over and over again. One of the things that we need to open our minds to is that many times when we fall, I think one of the things that we do is we really only talk about sin after it's happened. Like accountability is getting together and going, how many times did you sin last week? Right? That's kind of what we've, well, do it, do it better next time. Right? That's kind of what we say. We get together. But see, if we know if we know that this world is full of wants that are against God, and we know we still have a fleshly nature that wants many of those things, and we know that those things are defined as temptations, desires, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, if we can get to that point where we start to recognize those things as they begin, as wants and desires, the goal would be to have people that are like, you get on the phone and go, I'm going down this path. I need someone with me. Keep me from going down this path. To be together as the body. I'm not in a great place tonight. If I stay at home by myself, I am going to do something I don't want to do. Can you come hang out with me? I need to go do this thing, but I need someone to go with me. It's to get to that point in that loving relationship with believers and ourselves that we start to see temptations as they develop versus just reacting to them all the time, right? See, we need to start dealing with sin ahead of it because there's a progression to it. Because many of us get to the point where we feel like we just can't get up anymore that we're just going to keep falling into sin, that this sin is just part of me, that I just have to live this way for the rest of my life, and that is not what God's Word says. It doesn't say it's going to be easy. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has come upon you except that which is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way out so you may be able to bear it. One of the things we need to look at when we've sinned is to look back and go, 
Where were the temptations and where were the ways out? What were the doors, what were the ways I didn't take? And how do I take those doors next time? See, we need to start being aware of our surroundings, not putting ourselves into situations that feed our own wants and desires because we have been set free from having to live that way. We need to live in his power through his word, through the Holy Spirit. And so what does this mean for you today? There's a lot in this sermon. (laughs) There's a lot I left out. But one of the things, there's probably a lot of questions about some of the things in here. Paul addresses a lot of it, and there's a lot of supporting scripture that goes along with what Paul is teaching here. And so I'd encourage you that if you have questions, to continue the dialogue. And as we come to Christ today, as we come to his table, through his word, he's given us the truth of the world, the truth that we can be strengthened to stand firm in this world. He's given us the method which is the Holy Spirit and the power. See, he's given us everything we need to stand firm, to not lose ground, and to live for him. So before you come to the table today, I'd ask that you spend some time in prayer about areas of your life that you may need to address with God, things that you need to repent of, things that you need to grow in. We ask that, that if you're not a believer, that, that you do not come and partake from the table. This is something for believers that, that Jesus instituted for his believers. I'd also suggest that if you have young children that don't understand communion and are not saved, that they shouldn't participate in it as well. The reason being is this is something that is very important in the teachings of God, and we don't want to minimize it or make it so common to them that they do not understand what the purpose of it is. So as we come to the table, as we do this in remembrance of him, as we look once again to the cross, because without the cross, nothing Paul teaches is worthwhile. It's all based on the promises of Jesus, the advocate that he promised to send us by the, when he left. So as Nate comes up to play, we'll pray. Uh, come take the elements, uh, grab your, your juice and your, your bread, sit back down, and then at the end, I'll come up and we'll take the elements together. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that this morning, that anything that, that was communicated by me that was not of you would just be flushed from people's, eye, people's minds, Lord. I pray that, that you have spoken through your word. I pray that people are starting to see your teachings how you have given us strength and power to stand firm against the schemes of the evil one and that you have conquered victory and that we stand firm in those promises. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today who is struggling, struggling with who they are in Christ, struggling with temptation, struggling with sins, that they will seek help They will go to your word and go to biblical counsel, whether it's from Sunday school teachers or pastors or parents, Lord, but they would go somewhere to get biblical truth about what they're dealing with. Lord, as we come to your table today, may we come in respect and honor of you, remembering what you did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
on the night before crucifixion, Jesus sat with his disciples. It says, on the night when he was betrayed, Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. And after supper, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear Lord, dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that we sit under your gospel today, under the good news that you redeem sim- sinners back to yourself that you have reconciled the lost, that we have been given inheritance and sealed for eternity. Lord, may we just stay focused on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.